Hi everybody and welcome to another digital piano review here at Miriam Pianos. My name is Stu Harrison and today we're looking at Roland's Juno DS88. It's an 88 note weighted synthesizer. It's low cost, it's a lot of fun to use. We're gonna be taking a look at every single area of its functionality so that you at home can figure out whether it might be an interesting choice for you. If it is the first time to the channel, we would really appreciate it if you did hit that subscribe button and the notification bell. So every time we come out with a new video, you are aware of it, you can come check it out and you can participate with comments uh, and give us a few extra views. We always love it when you do that. So without any further ado, let's dive into the Juno DS88 right away. So we are back with the Roland Juno DS88. Uh, and we normally cover three sections with digital pianos. We usually do uh, like sound and then we dive into action and features. But with the Juno DS88, the whole kind of essence of this machine is its features. And I'd really like to start there because that ultimately you know, covers sound and we'll, we'll you know, make a mention of the action uh, throughout, uh, you know, and, and a little later on in the video. This model, I should mention, is available in three different sizes. We're taking a look at the 88, which is the full size, but there is a small one, uh, which is uh, just sort of spring-loaded uh, keys. Then we've got the medium one. I believe it's probably like 61, 73, and 88 is usually the three sizes. Uh, we're taking a look at the largest. I usually prefer to play on an 88 note when I have the option, uh, but I'm not... Uh, you know, there are people who actually prefer uh, some of the lighter actions, some of the smaller actions. So uh, to each their own, we're taking a look at the larger one. But the feature set is the same across the entire, uh, all, all three models. We're going to cover uh, really two main, well, I should say three main sections of the instrument. And they're actually laid out that way right on the user interface. We're going to talk about the keyboard modes that are available and its control surfaces. We're going to talk about the, the internal sound sources that are available on the Juno DS. And then we're going to be talking about this super fun phrase pad, which really is uh, kind of both a, uh, let's call it uh, a rhythm section, rhythm pad trigger, as well as a basic sequencer all in one. Uh, so let's start over here on the left side, uh, which is where we've got our keyboard modes. This is where we've got our various controls. So a couple of very cool things about this. There is some uh, kind of design language, I guess you could say, that's uh, in common with the DS that you find also in the RD series, the RD88 and the RD2000. Uh, so the DS comes with these four um, multifunction knobs and you can um, uh, sort of scroll through the three different sets of functions that are uh, assignable to the knobs just with this simple select button. You can see this nice arrow makes it really easy to know what you're on. There's also a change on the on-screen display uh, that lets you know what those knobs are. So if for any reason you don't want to shift your eyes away from the control, you can just look up here and say, oh, okay, that is obviously on the envelope control. We scroll down, then we've got, uh, you know, chorus delay, reverb is assigned there, um, the mic reverb. And then on the assignable, you can see that it's obviously got the EQ. We've got EQ, low gain, mid, high, et cetera, et cetera. And that's probably different for each of the patches. Uh, so these are very easy real-time controls uh, that a lot of people love. I definitely really like having those controls, and they've got them. Then we've got four faders. We've got a mic in uh, input, which is great because who likes reaching around the back uh, to adjust the gain on a mic and that's the only volume input that's super annoying. Uh, so it's great that we've got um, the volume slider here. I know that the gain knob and the volume knob aren't exactly the same function gain. You want to basically set and leave depending on you know the overall dynamic range and mic in is the level that's passing through the system. So you use both, but really once your gain set, 
you want to just have a nice, easy to adjust uh, mic setting. You've got that right here. Uh, the lower and the upper are the two voice controls that you're going to have depending on whether you're using split or dual mode. We'll get into that later. Uh, and then this vocoder auto pitch, which is, I mean, I don't know if I'm the only one, but I just lo like lose hours of my life sitting there playing with a vocoder. Maybe it's because I can't sing very well. It's the idea that I'm sort of hearing my voice do things that isn't disgusting is pretty cool to me. Maybe there's other people who fall into that category, uh, but I am not blessed with a natural singing voice, so the vocoder and the auto pitch was something that caught my eye right away. When we get into the different keyboard modes that can be used, this will be familiar to anybody who's ever used a digital piano because this is something that you find across all manufacturers and all lines, this concept of both split and dual. So what is split mode? Well, split mode is where you've got two sounds, one of the sounds occupies some section of the lower and one of the sounds occupies some section of the upper. And the, the uh, DS has a number of preset, uh, you know, uh, split modes, I guess you could call it. Um, And it's easy to adjust exactly where that split point is. You can just use your cursor uh, and easily do it this way. Uh, so C4 is right there, that's middle C. So uh, you've got lots of options uh, to go through and select all sorts of different, uh, you know, uh, things. There's also a very easy way uh, to shift the octave. You'll notice that that's probably playing at least one octave lower than your ear would like. So that's an easy one. And you can save all of these. Very, very easy uh, to save these. So you can either write over uh, a performance um, or you can write a specific uh, patch setting, but normally you'd be wanting to uh, write the performance. And then you can overwrite the presets or they provide you with a whole uh, user area where you can uh, save those uh, as performances. So you've got split mode, dual mode, is where you've got two sounds that both occupy the entire range and you're basically blending two sounds together. And again, this is very, very easy uh, to use. So you've got your various categories that you can select for each one of these. Uh, let's say that we wanna have some sort of a pad and then the other one is the 88 stage grand. So it's right there. And so using the lower and upper faders over here, we can mix those in real time. So on and so forth. Some gigging musicians, and depending on the complexity of the show and how thick the music is, may need uh, layers and splits and, and uh, you know zone control that goes just beyond the two. I mean, the DS is not going to be a one-size-fits-all. It's a lower-priced instrument. It's designed to give access to some of these types of features without just going you know full bore. For example, on the RD2000, you have the ability to have eight zones or nine, no, eight zones on there um, and mix both internal and external uh, sound sources and you know complete zone control and key range and velocity and all that stuff. So I mean if you are in a situation where you really need that level of control and that level of thickness to some of your tones, well the DS isn't should you know is not where you should be looking. You're you're you want to be looking at a full-on pro stage piano. The Juno DS really is kind of a lightweight entry point, like I've said a couple of times, into some of these uh, types of features. Uh, we've got the arpeggiator. Oh no, 
I should not skip over super layer. So it took me a little while to really get what they were going for with the super layer. And anyone who's ever worked in any sort of production or mixing, especially if you've ever worked with vocal tracking, will be familiar with this concept of a doubler, uh, where you're uh, taking that this the same uh, sort of audio source, um, like so. Let's say you've got you know a vocal track or a piano track, and you want to make it sound thicker or wider. You want to expand the stereo field, so you actually have this plugin or type of plugins that will duplicate that and then give you the control to pan them or slightly detune them or slightly delay them so that you get this thicker, fuller sound. It's like, instead of hearing just one of you, now you're hearing three or four of you. And I, I have to assume that that's exactly what they were trying for when they thought of this super layer function. And so a super layer is where you have a single patch and now they're uh, just layering over two, three, four, up to five of those same patches, but giving you the option to slightly detune them. And every time you add it, it's thickening the sound a little bit. So it's really functioning like a doubler. Uh, so I'll, if we go back to piano, because of course that's a nice benchmark. Everyone kind of knows what a piano is supposed to sound like. So the Grand Piano DS, that's the default piano. <laughs> And we're in super layer mode, and so that's three layers. So let's just go right from, um, yeah. So here is one. If we go to super layer, and I've got layers on two. So that's what two sounds like. So it's already changing that pretty considerably. Three. four, and finally five. So with a piano sound, it sort of produces a, a bit of a weird effect because it's such, uh, the tone on a piano is supposed to be really super stable. As you layer those up, you wind up with some odd phasing that you probably don't want there. Um, but this type of thing on a Rhodes or this type of thing on a pad or a lead is really where you start to get some interesting thickened effects. Now, one thing you do get when you're using a piano is the minute you start to detune all of these layers, the piano instantly is going to start to sound honky-tonk. You can hear it's starting to create really specific phasing there. Pretty bizarre stuff. Anyway, so that's the super layer. Some people, I suspect, are never going to use the super layer. Some people may be using it all the time, especially if you're soloing. Uh, if you're on a synth, and you start to uh, really. That's quite a bit thicker than this. So I can definitely see a use for it, especially if you're somebody who's going to be playing some lead lines. So there's your super layer. Um, let's talk about the sounds that are included on this because uh, they're pretty lush. This doesn't use any of the supernatural sound engines, uh, which of course are very specific algorithmic um, instrument specific programming that Roland has on a lot of their instruments uh, that gives you extra control over those specific instruments as well as just thicker, more complex tone generally. So I know there's piano, a supernatural piano engine, there's supernatural drum engines, supernatural, you know, all kinds of engines, e-piano, organ, all of them. Uh, this doesn't get into that, so you don't have that crazy, um, you know, super precise control over individual patches, but there's a ton of patches to be able to use and select from, which is really great. And, um, all of the uh, categories are laid out in a really nice, easy to navigate way. So we've got drums down here. We 
we're just gonna get out of super layer mode because it sounds weird. Piano, of course, we we're already looking at that. Yeah, these are, you know, these are really great sounding, thick, lush. Tones, definitely good enough to gig with. And some of these definitely good enough to record with. Some of the most fun you're gonna have on a DS is exploring all of these pads and keyboard sounds they have. There's there just so much going on. It's it's a lot of fun. Anyway, there is not nearly enough time to actually get through all of these, uh, you know, individually on a video like this. So I'm kind of just randomly sampling a few for you guys to, to hear. Uh, the brass section is a lot of fun. Uh, and then the vocal pad. synths for your leads. Um, and so on and so forth. I want to get into the phrase pad because uh, I think for most people if they got over the intimidation of how to use the phrase pad this could be an incredibly good way to start sketching out songs sketching out interesting textures, bass lines. If you were interested at all in doing some writing and you didn't really know how to start um, accessing a tool that was fun to use, wasn't terribly complicated, and, and, uh, and just you know grew your ears a little bit in the right direction, um, the Juno uh, phrase pad is a ton of fun. It's not a full sequencer, so this is not something where you're gonna be able to lay out three or 400 bars, 16 tracks. It's not really the point. Uh, the point here is to let you uh, immediately start playing around with these combinations of different eight bar phrases um, and looping and layering and, and just having fun like that. And I'm just going to quickly demonstrate how you would actually use that uh, just so that people who are thinking about this instrument or instruments like this just understand how truly simple it is to start enjoying these types of features because I know how it is. Unless you really live in this space, when you sit down to an instrument like this and you look at these lights over here and that's like, oh, I'm sure that's very cool, but I'm never going to use that in a million years because it's just, it's, it seems like it's such a steep learning curve. Well, it's not. You just have to stop thinking that this is going to be really scary and really uh, difficult to use. So here, right literally if you were to take it out of the box, this is how to use the pattern sequencer on the Juno uh, DS88. Really, really, really easy. So we're gonna press pattern sequencer. And let's go to, um, I'm just going to like a, a completely blank uh, user pattern here. There are a bunch of presets. So for you to understand how it works, you, you may want to go on uh, here and, and play around with this. Um, so it's easy to do. Again, you just press pattern sequencer, you go into PRST preset, uh, and then you've got all of these different ones here. Uh, and So there are obviously six elements happening right now. And if you want to turn some of those off, 
then you would just turn the mute function on and you could actually turn them off. So now there's literally nothing. I've just muted all six of those. So there's a bass happening there. So you can kind of add and take away things as you go. But I want to show you how to actually build this yourself because this is where it really gets fun. So I'm switching back to user so that we're going to load uh, something that's completely uh, from scratch. Uh, and so the first thing we want to do, there's kind of a weird little feature where you can take one rhythm uh, into this automatically because there's two modes for the phrase pad. One is pattern sequencer and one is rhythm pattern. You would think that these two functions kind of work um, interchangeably or, or at least that there's lots of uh, different ways that they work together. They don't actually. And the thing that really is a little bit puzzling to me is why pattern sequencer stays on when rhythm pattern is pressed. Because they're almost mutually exclusive, you're like, that, why, that, yeah, doesn't make any sense. Anyway, um, rhythm pattern, allows you to have eight different rhythms on, on the pad which you can use and you can set whatever tempo you want. Uh, you can tap it, you can set it in the top right corner here. Um, and so if you're playing along with a band or a bass player or whatever, or you just, just want to play along with say a bass and left hand piano there and a rhythm, no problem. so on and so forth. Um, but let's say that we want to take just one of those patterns and we want to use that as the basis for our pattern sequence. So it does allow you to do that. So we have picked, or I'm just going to go with that one. Why not? And you can see that there's kind of, it's highlighted. It's the last one I've just picked here. So if I go back to pattern sequence and I'm going to put my, uh, my first track, and you can see that there's thing, this thing called rhythm pattern first loop record, which basically means the minute that I press record for the first time, it imports that rhythm into my little sequence. And that's the only time while I'm building one of these phrase uh, pattern sequences that I can use something that's on the rhythm pattern and bring it in. Otherwise, the two don't really talk to each other. So let's do that right now. I am going to uh, turn that on. And then uh, basically the first time that I press record, uh, it will automatically import that into, uh, you know, into my sequence. Uh, so, and let's do, uh, and okay, so let's see. Pattern length, we're going to set to eight bars. With copying just means if there's something that's already done, it automatically duplicates uh, what was there in the first bar through all of it. But since nothing's there, we can just say yes, it's not going to make any difference at all. So we've got our first loop record on, uh, and we're going to, and count in is wait note, which means you're going to hear a metronome, but basically as soon as I start to play, it's just going to do it. So if I, if I need four bars, five bars, three bars to collect my thoughts, uh, it's going to let us do that. So um, record. So now it's waiting for me to do something. And you can hear the one, two, three, four, one, two, three. And 
it goes back to the top. And so it's automatically put that uh, rhythm pattern onto track eight. And so when I turn my mute function on, uh, it's on eight. And the piano is on two. So you can always see what you've recorded when your mute's not on. The lights that are there means that there's information stored in those little loop tracks. Okay, so now we've got piano happening, we've got some drums happening. Let's put a bass on here. having trouble hearing that bass, so I'm actually going to turn the bass up a little bit and turn the piano down. And we can turn the drums down a little bit. Now, let's put Okay, so now we've got five tracks happening here. So let's strip them all back so we can really hear what's going on. So we've recorded bass on one. So we've, when we're muting everything except one, now we can hear that happening. We know that the drums got put onto eight, so we're gonna leave those off now. And let's add some piano. We'll add the drums back in. Then we know we've got an organ on three and we've got sort of a bit of an obnoxious lead happening on four. So that is how to create a little pattern sequence on the Roland Juno DS. Not that difficult. And like I said, it's a really interesting creative launching pad to come up with some textures and some song ideas. Uh, we just talked about the rhythm pattern. Audio uh, is the third usage for this uh, phrase pad. Essentially, if you have eight audio files on a USB key, 
uh, like samples or you know loops you want to play back, you can actually uh, pick audio and then assign those various audio files to your 8. Now I don't have a USB key in there, but I'm just letting you know that the functionality is there. Um, and, of, and it's asking me if I want to discard that pattern. I don't think anyone will be harmed or hurt if I get rid of that. Not exactly uh, musical perfection, but it served the purpose as a musical demonstration. So that's a, a pretty good uh, summation of uh, sort of what's happening on there. Now, I did uh, tell you how fun the vocoder is, and for people who don't know what a vocoder is, I'm going to just quickly demonstrate this uh, as well. So basically, a vocoder allows you to use your keys as your pitch information, but the shape and the texture of the sound is coming from your voice, which is such a cool idea. So if we go back to vocoder, and then we're going to let's use let's just pr you know press a chord down one two two three four five six one two three four five six seven eight testing the vocoder function testing the vocoder function and you kind of get the idea of what's happening here it's so geeky Anyway, so that's how the vocoder works. My cameraman is like, just, I, I can't tell whether he found that entertaining or just, just ridiculous. Well, I think it was both. I think it was a little bit of both. Uh, in terms of the connectivity that the Juno DS has, it's got your quarter inch outs in stereo, which is it kind of just a necessary minimum for an instrument like this. Uh, it has the quarter inch mic input. Uh, of course, we just demonstrated that. Uh, you've got your standard MIDI in and out, you've got your USB, uh, and you've got the option for a control pedal, such as a volume pedal or switch, uh, and then your sustain. Uh, I mentioned in the unboxing video that this thing actually has the option to go totally portable. And on the one hand, I can see why people would want to use that, uh, because if you're using this as a compositional tool and you're going around with, say, a laptop that's also operating off battery, then certainly you could use it privately. But because there's no speakers on this, um, I can't see how the portability is going to help uh, for any sort of a performance. You definitely are going to have to have this hooked up into some sort of a PA or uh, an amplifier, which does need power. There isn't really such thing as battery-operated, uh, you know, main PA speakers or, or uh, you know, amplifiers or anything like that. So uh, for personal use and especially for writing or composing, um, I can see where uh, the battery operated thing would be a, a big plus, especially in the smaller models uh, of the Juno DS. One last point that we're going to cover, I know this is uh, getting into a longer video, but this has been so much fun to share the DS with you, um, is the action. I really like the action on the DS. I know that, you know, actions are very personal. Some people are big fans of the role in action. Some people prefer how the Kawais feel. Some people prefer how the Yamahas feel. Um, the action that they're using on this isn't something that's really available in their newest models, right? The, the PHA-50 is what you're getting on their RD-2000. The PHA-4 is really what's available across most of the other line. This one um, is, I think it's called a, a GF um, or just F uh, feel action. Uh, or I, I believe, or G-feel action? G-feel action. I think it's grand-feel action. And uh, it feels closer to the PHA-50, but it's a little bit lighter, and I love uh, the sense of the repetition on here. Uh, it's very, uh, very easy to just glide over this and just play with a lot of, of uh, you know, it's very effortless. <laughs> So 
Uh, anybody who is used to what a decent 88 note weighted feel is is really gonna love playing on this. It's not too light, it's not too heavy, uh, it doesn't feel spongy, doesn't feel springy, um, and there's there's decent touch sensitivity on it. I don't think I'd want to be using this to lay down a really exposed piano track uh, because I you know the lower dynamic ranges I don't think are as sensitive as some of the other keyboards out there but for live performance and just you know playing around and composing this thing is just awesome so I hope you have loved enjoyed uh, learning about the DS as much as I have uh, it's it's just been a ton of fun and I'm really impressed with what this delivers for the price uh, it's start it's sort of a product that bridges an entry-level uh, and, a, and a professional model. It, it gives people a taste of some of the types of features that are available in the really, really upper end stage pianos. Um, but it doesn't dumb it down uh, at, to the point where they're not musically satisfying and interesting to use. And I think that's just great. So uh, please let us know what you thought of the video. Uh, leave us a comment. We always really love hearing from the musical community. And if you haven't had a chance to subscribe, we would also really appreciate it if you were to join that musical community so that you come back, see lots of other videos. We're always coming out with new content, and we want you to see it. We want you to be able to enjoy it. So my name is Stu Harrison. This has been the Miriam Pianos YouTube channel, and we will see you back for more shortly. Thanks so much. The sun is rising, feel the warmth of my